Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rena Lachlan, and I am the program director for the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania. I'm so excited to be your host for our final session about living an active lifestyle by maximizing community access and participation. So far, we've had terrific and informative sessions regarding maximizing safety and independence at home and seizure detection and alarms. We hope this Safety Devices webinar series has been helpful and empowering to you. Okay, just a reminder that all of you will be muted throughout um, the presentation and your cameras are not on. If you have any questions, please put them in chat and we will present them to Lindsay. Today, we have the honor of having Lindsay DeLong present on maximizing community access and participation. Lindsay is a licensed occupational therapist with over 10 years of experience working in the home and community environment to improve quality of life through modifications and education. Lindsay, the floor is yours. Well, I am so thrilled to be here again. Um, I am looking forward to kind of digging deep into community access um, and just uh, really advocating for greater participation and comfort in being out into your world, whether that's um, community parks or traveling abroad. I hope to kind of touch on a lot of those different areas. So just a quick outline of what I'm going to be discussing. I'm going to introduce myself, which I already have, um, and I'm going to go through some community advocacy, some kind of macro level things that as um, a group we can kind of work to improve access through, as well as some really specific areas that I like to highlight for maximizing safety and participation with hopefully some good, really useful content that you guys can use right away. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. So community advocacy, this is obviously an area, if you're already here and you're already taking part in these webinars, you are already an advocate. Um, whether you yourself um, have epilepsy or you love somebody with epilepsy or you're a caregiver for somebody with epilepsy, advocating for those individuals is a part of your daily life. So I don't need to harp on any of that. What I would like to talk about is a little bit of how you can use that advocacy within your communities to build better situations for people to be able to engage. So I wanna start by talking about working with community leaders. Um, one of the things I've learned with being an OT, working a lot with the community, is that there are a lot of really um, engaged uh, leaders in our community who want to hear from people, and that means everybody. So if you're somebody who is really inspired and motivated to kind of make for a better community experience for individuals with epilepsy, find those community leaders who are open to those discussions and write them an email, send them a message, they are usually really open to these conversations because we all want to advocate for a more inclusive environment. So the, one of the areas that I've had a lot of success in is the parks departments. So local parks departments are always looking for input from community members on how to make their spaces more um, engaging and more uh, accessible for the larger population. And what we've learned is that universal design accessibility, it benefits everyone, not just the individual participants who have a disability. So being able to engage with like parks departments, for example, is a really awesome place to start to build more um, inclusive communities. And you guys are an excellent voice for that. Um, and I hope that this inspires somebody to go out and send them an email or message them and say the epilepsy community really would benefit from this, that, or the other modification to our existing um, parks. So another one is corporate accessibility contacts. Corporate structures, stores, um, large-scale entertainment venues, things like that, they always have a corporate accessibility contact. Now, this can be a little tricky to find sometimes, but by simply Googling these corporate structures, a lot of times you can find that people are already working with these individuals to try to motivate and ch make change. A really good example of this one is that a while back through social media, I was sent a, um, a, a petition that was going around for Target the store to add adult changing stations to their bathrooms. This was being sent through the chain of command in Target and has been then accepted by Target and is actually something they're in discussion of doing with all of their new and existing stores is adding adult changing stations. So this is an example of how corporate accessibility contacts is another really important place to um, put some advocacy behind. And this again would include the epilepsy community. 
team up with university programs. This one I'm a huge advocate for as a former university student, both on the undergraduate and graduate level, I was always being asked to do um, community-based projects. And so this is an awesome way to collaborate between um, future professionals in the healthcare area and communities to kind of really build and advocate for better understanding and awareness, and then ultimately create these really awesome projects. And I'll give an example. So when I was a graduate student, um, for my occupational therapy degree, we had to do a lot of community um, integrated programs. And one of them was in the local public museum. And we had to go through and do a bunch of uh, uh, evaluations. And we worked with individuals who were um, at very different levels of function. So wheelchair level, um, using assistive devices like a walker, people with low vision, people with um, low hearing, things like that. And we were able to then go through, evaluate the museum space, and then present a very thorough write-up of how they could improve their accessibility. It was a fantastic way to work with um, the community as well as the individuals living in the community to create an accessible space. And I am proud to say that a lot of the changes that we recommended, they implemented and are still there today. So getting involved with those types of sy systems can be a wonderful way to build a more inclusive uh, community. So getting a little bit more into this um, and how this would be specific to the epilepsy community, Let's talk about some ways that you can advocate for those community areas to be safer and more inclusive. One of the big ones, and you see this fairly often, is the sensory stimulation warnings, things like flashing lights, auditory stimula stimulation, even um, uh, sound or um, smells and things like that. Anything that could be considered a trigger for individuals with epilepsy or with other sensory processing disorders. Um, are made aware of on their websites, in handouts, at the entrances. So having those sensory stimulation warnings present is super important. So if you don't see something like that present at a facility in a place that you would like to visit, it's always a great idea to ask about it. Um, wheelchair and mobility aid access. Obviously, we have come a fairly long ways in that with ADA, but it's not perfect. And there are still a lot of places, restaurants, stores, things like that, that don't always have the keenest awareness of wheelchair and mobility aid needs. So advocating for that is huge. Emergency preparedness and training. This one is a shocking, uh, I found a shocking amount of um, issues with this. Um, emergency preparedness is one of those things where many places could have some level of training in this, but seizures is one that often gets missed or it gets brushed over very lightly. We tend to train folks on how to do CPR, run an AED, we don't actually tell them how to deal with a seizure. And I saw this firsthand many times over as a, somebody who worked at a pool. I was um, I witnessed seizures on occasion. Um, and it was really sad because a lot of individuals who worked for the pool with me didn't know how to deal with it. And so it was really important that we advocated for and got additional training. And this is something that I think is so important in all community components is making sure that epilepsy or seizure specific training is uh, available to all of their employees. Equipment availability, whether that's for rent or for borrow, when you go someplace, things like um, beaches having wheelchairs that are beach friendly or boardwalks that are friendly, having the um, availability of sensory modulating kits. This is another thing that we actually proposed for our local public museum was that we would offer sensory modulating kits, which would offer things like sound deadening headphones for specific exhibits that had high sound, um, darkened glasses for areas that had high light stimulation. Things like that were made available without individuals having to ask for them specifically. They were just something that existed um, in the facilities that were built because they had the advocates working with them to create a more accessible space. And then personal preparedness. This falls back on the individual. How prepared are you to be able to advocate for yourself and your needs when you're out in the community? And I do have an image here of something that I've really liked to have in uh, available for individuals who are out in the community, perhaps in car seats if they're children, or this one is a seatbelt um, cover that gives specific information about the individual. It works like a medical alert bracelet, but it's on their physical person if they were to be in an accident or something like that. So that's an example of personal preparedness for community access. Okay, let's get even deeper here. Now we're getting into the micro, we're getting into the more specific things that you can use to engage more safely um, or help your loved one or somebody you're caring for engage more safely in some sort of community activity. 
Water safety is something that is near, near and dear to my heart. I spent nine years as a lifeguard and swim lessons instructor. I established special needs swim programs and actually wrote my master's thesis on um, aquatic therapy and pediatrics. So this is an area I absolutely love. And I think water access is such an important thing that so many individuals don't necessarily get to engage in because of safety concerns. So I'm gonna highlight a few things here that can really help make water access a safe option for individuals with epilepsy or any other seizure conditions. First things first, and this is so important, inform the staff, informing lifeguards, informing a manager that the individual that you're with or perhaps yourself has a seizure history and simply making them aware of that helps them to be more guided in how they would address an emergency situation. They're gonna be able to engage much quicker. They're going to be able to use much better um, you know, practices because they're gonna know what they're dealing with. So have that be something that you communicate with the staff and they will appreciate that, I promise. Flotation devices and life jacket options. There are many options for life jackets and flotation that allow individuals who have a seizure history or have other disabilities that make keeping their head above water super, super important. Um, I have highlighted two areas um, that you can use uh, that will give you some help with this. And one of them is the pfd-a.com. They create um, really specific targeted adapted life jackets. That's the two images on the bottom that are red. Um, and these two life jackets are highly focused on head, head and neck support. So they're going to allow you to engage in the water, but keep your head above water relatively safely. Now, I will say all of these are going to require that you are not alone in your swimming activity. The buddy system is still going to be incredibly important here, but these things will add an extra layer of safety. The one next to it in the yellow, that's by Danmar. They're going to be the same creators as the ones that make the soft um, closed foam um, helmets. They also create flotation devices and they are very widely ranged. Everything from these that just look like a head support to full body support and they can be made custom. So that's really fascinating um, way to help people engage in the water with very, with a variety of physical needs. So that's a really cool thing. Um, I do mention the buddy system here and I'll say it again. Um, you should never swim alone. Just in general, that's a good rule of thumb, but even more important when you're dealing with somebody who maybe has um, some unpredictable medical needs. Home and private pool fencing. This is an area that I have advocated for strongly, and this is another place where you can advocate for your own safety and the safety of those around you. Communities, um, and especially private residences, it is required that you have a certain amount of protection around the pool and different states have different laws. So you have to look specifically at what is the um, law in your state, but having a surround that protects the pool from being um, accessed by accident um, is so, so important. So if you're living in a community that has backyard access without fencing, um, that may be something you would want to address with your community, your local, um, with your neighbors really. Okay, I included these two slides because I found them online and I find them to be extremely helpful and fascinating. And this is for everyone. This isn't just specific to the epilepsy community, but this is just really good information. If you or somebody you know is an avid swimmer, but you have some concerns about their swim safety, color of swimsuit matters. Um, these, I have two slides. This one here is gonna be pool and the next one's gonna be lake and you'll see the difference, but this identifies the different colors that are going to be optimal for identifying somebody who's struggling, who has slipped under the water. And you can see some of the colors nearly disappear underwater, whereas other colors stay fairly visible as the person descends underwater at greater depths. I'll show you the, the lake one is really shocking because there's only a few colors here that really are visible beyond a small distance under the water. So this is super important from a protection safety standpoint and something you should be considering, um, not just for your loved ones with epilepsy, but for anybody who's out swimming in these bodies of water. This, is, this could save a life. Okay, so we're gonna step away from the lakes and the pools for a little bit, and we're gonna venture over to the parks and the playgrounds. Um, this is an area I've spent a lot of time in with two young children myself, and it's been really fascinating to see some shifting in the um, designing of playgrounds to be more inclusive in ways that are supportive to communities like those of the epilepsy community. So first things first, the very first thing I evaluate with somebody is emergency access. 
So if we're going to be using a, a park, whether it's as the children's area of a park, or if you're somebody who likes to take hikes or long walks and there's trails, identifying cell service availability. How well does your phone work in those places? Could you call for help easily if need be? Could somebody else call for help easily if need be? Um, and then first responder access. If you did need to call for help, how easy would it be to um, have a first responder be able to gain access to you? So this is important for hiking trails, um, you know, those parks that have a long drive back to them, making sure that wherever you are has those particular access points identified um, and communicated is super, super important. And of course, making sure others know where you are so that they could find you in the situation that you have a problem. And that would be part of your personal care plan. So making sure that that emergency access um, has been identified by you and any concerns that you might have is available. So whether that's um, you wear a life, you know, a identifier bracelet or necklace, or you have something on your person that can help others to provide the appropriate assistance if need be, if you were to out, be out using these places on your own. Protective headgear. Um, obviously, this is an area that is really important for independent safety. Um, and there's a variety of headgear options out there. Um, I did include the traditional closed cell um, foam headgear, which is FDA approved and extremely um, effective in preventing severe head trauma. Um, and then I also included um, next to it something called a rib cap, R-I-B-C-A-P. This is a company that I've worked with a little bit um, and they create integrated headgear that provides FDA approved closed foam cell um, protection, but integrated into a more traditional hat. So this one is a bucket hat. They also have what look like baseball caps and um, like a beanie cap that would be more for winter, um, as well as like they have a little kid's one that's really cute that, ha that looks like a bomber hat. So they're really a, kind of a nice way to integrate the helmet without it being so, so obvious. It has the chin strap for good security. Um, and they're just a really nice company to work with. I found them to be um, really responsive and willing to work with their customers. So definitely give them a look if you're interested in kind of an alternative um, headgear for protecting. Just so everyone is aware too, these, these, head, these protective head uh, helmets are going to protect from severe head trauma, um, lacerations, injuries like that, but they, can, they might not protect you from concussions. Um, striking your head on the ground with a helmet on like this will um, create less head trauma, but it won't eliminate the risk altogether. So that's where the concept of like, when we're talking about playgrounds and parks, the supportive playscapes that have the additional um, rubber matting on the ground so that if you were to fall, you'd have that additional cushion, cushion versus concrete, um, stone, things like that, where it's a very hard fall. Having the additional layer of these rubberized floor mats, which I'm seeing more and more in um, school, par um, school playgrounds as well as public playgrounds, um, can make a huge difference too. So those layer of protection makes a big, big difference. Fencing. Um, obviously, this is an interesting one because most parks don't include fencing around their play areas. And for those with um, elopement risks, um, this is something that can be really important and something you can advocate for with your local parks and rec departments is adding fencing to certain play areas to make them a safe option for individuals who maybe are an elopement risk or tend to wander. So that's something that you can advocate for that um, some are open to adding to certain play areas. Water safety feature or safe water features. This is kind of an alternative to um, the traditional pool. And I am loving that we're seeing these all over. I have a picture down here. I believe this one's in Washington DC or nearby, it might be in Virginia. But these um, uh, splash pads are a great alternative to the traditional pool or lake water feature where you have some additional concerns of accessibility as well as that fear of drowning. A, a splash pad is an awesome way to engage in a water-based activity that'll cool you down in the summer, but has a lot more accessibility features naturally built into it. They are wheelchair safe if your wheelchair is okay getting a little wet. Um, not all are, some that you have alternatives for that. And that's another piece of equipment you could advocate for in your local community is a waterproof wheelchair that could be used in these types of play environments, which would be so, so neat. Um, but they also are coming with, some of them have the, the non, um, the rubberized flooring, so they're not slippery underfoot or they're less of a hard fall risk because they don't have the concrete. Many are still concrete based, but again, this is an area we can advocate and build awareness around because these are such a nice, safe, accessible 
um, play feature for kiddos and adults. Um, they can be really, really fun for everybody. Okay, so we're going to get bigger a little bit. We're going to talk about travel. This is kind of a quick rundown of some of the considerations for safe travel. Many of these recommendations come directly from um, epilepsy professionals and physicians. So um, these are really important things to consider if you are looking to travel outside of your own community. And of course, I would strongly recommend if it is safe and an option for you financially, traveling is a wonderful way to um, expand your world. So some considerations here, transportation options. Uh, one of the beautiful things is we now have so many more options for um, transportation, Uber, Lyft, um, as well as the existing public transportations in any given region. Knowing about what options are preferred in any given area is really important because in one city, you may find that they um, predominantly use one you know, Uber or Lyft versus another city. I have found that that tends to be the case. Um, so just being aware of that ahead of time so you know what your transportation options are going to be. Flying with epilepsy. Um, and this is, this is a really interesting one. There's quite a bit of information about this online, and I tried to highlight the most important ones that I could um, identify. And the number one thing was medication. Being aware of what your medication regimen is, making sure you stay tight to that regimen, as well as having consistent um, and easy access to medication as needed. So keeping it on your person versus putting it in a difficult to reach suitcase and then having extra packed so that you know you're going to have a sufficient supply of medication wherever you go. So that's super, super important. An emergency plan. This is similar to what we've already discussed in several other places. And that is the idea that you are aware of what your personal um, seizure experience is like or the, the person you're caring for seizure experiences like, and you have a plan for how you would um, deal with that if it came up in a different environment, say while traveling in an airport, on an airplane, you know, really kind of have to have a plan for each of those scenarios so that if it were to come up, you would have a little bit more um, of a process in place. And another piece of this emergency plan is communicating your needs ahead of time to the staff. So one of the things that was strongly recommended was contacting an airline ahead of time, contacting the airports ahead of time to know what their processes are, whether it's um, to help you via wheelchair, knowing how that is done through the airport. Um, they all have transportation systems set up now, and it's just really a strong idea to contact them ahead of time. And then on the planes, speaking to the, um, the staff of the airplane to make them aware. So that again, much like that with communicating with a lifeguard, if you communicate with them ahead of time, they will be able to enact their safety protocols much quicker and more efficiently if an emergency were to come up. Select an aisle seat. Aisle seat's gonna be far more, um, far more uh, use, uh, useful as far as being able to access somebody in an emergency. It also will give you slightly more space um, if you were to need that. Um, talk to your seatmates, communicate. This is kind of a strong theme when it comes to being out in the community. And this can be something that's a little uncomfortable for some, but, and for some seatmates, this may be something that they become a little bit nervous about, but simply just making them aware. And, and if you feel comfortable enough, you know, saying, I don't expect anything. I just want it to be um, so that we're, we're being open. And then prioritizing things like sleep. This is, you know, could insert anything for sleep, prioritize diet, prioritize the things that keep your seizures controlled as best as possible. And certainly this is something that can be quite fluctuating, especially when you're incorporating travel. Um, but sleep seemed to be the number one um, trigger that people identify that comes up during travel experiences because you tend to be sleep deprived when you're throwing in long travel days. You tend to have issues with um, you know, you could have uh, changes in time zones so then you have the added jet lag and things like that. Those can be triggers for seizure activity. So again, knowing your triggers, you know, how is the climate of the new environment that you're traveling to going to impact you? Is it more humid or more dry than you used to or cold or hot? Your diet, how might that be impacted? What could you do to kind of prepare and test a few things before you go to make sure certain things aren't going to be problematic for you? Activity tolerance. This is a huge one because I think a lot of times we underestimate how much more fatiguing the same activity that you would do at home, doing it someplace else 
for whatever reason, tends to be significantly more fatiguing because it requires a significant um, amount of mental effort to do something in a new place. So having an awareness of where you're starting to hit that fatigue level and starting to back off at appropriate times so that you don't push yourself too hard and end up having to have, um, you know, having a medical emergency in that situation. So just there's a lot of information out there on ways that you can kind of be more aware and monitor. And I know the last webinar that we did was, um, was on that, was on seizure monitoring. And so having those types of things available to you will make travel a more, um, a safer option for many. Okay, this is a huge area, but gym and physical fitness, um, I, I'm highlighting some of the really, um, the major points of it, but as far as physical fitness is concerned, this is an area that a lot of people have identified as concerning because they don't feel like they can engage safely in traditional gym or physical fitness um, activities, whether that's because of their seizure activity is not controlled enough or they um, have a lot of issues with triggers around these types of environments. I wanted to highlight some things that can be done to make this safer. Um, Obviously, I highlighted seizure monitoring in the last slide, but this is huge for this one as well. Knowing how your body reacts to physical exertion and at what point in that physical exertion should you start to be more aware. Um, using things like smartwatches is a great place to have some to help build some awareness around your body's reaction to physical exertion. Knowing heart rate monitor, um, you can check blood pressure you can do pulse, all of these things can be ways to identify potential triggers that would be specific to physical activity. Trigger awareness, that's what we were just talking about, but this can also include things that might be present in um, a traditional gym environment. Gym environments are not particularly sensory friendly, unfortunately, though we have advocated for improvements and I have seen certain environments offer some change in this area. But things like the, the harsh overhead lighting um, can be really difficult for some. The noise, they can use really loud music sometimes. Um, and there's just a lot of activity with people. So knowing what your triggers are and then modifying your approach to the gym around those triggers. I am a huge advocate for finding a trainer. So finding a physical trainer who has who can be either made aware or already has some existing awareness about epilepsy and about what it means to you and how it impacts your ability to participate in a physical um, training experience is so, so valuable. And don't be um, afraid to find somebody to, to change trainers. If you start with somebody and they're just not seeming to get it for you, um, it's definitely important that you uh, be willing to look for others. I say the same thing about therapists. You need to be okay with the fact that if something's not a good fit for you and you kind of want to try something else, you're not feeling as supported as you need to, find somebody else. There are a lot of people in the training community and they're not all created equal. So definitely evaluate what your needs are and, and be willing to shop around a little bit. But finding a really good trainer who can identify and, and create appropriate exercise protocols for you is a great place to start. And it, this may also include working with a physical therapist first. If, for example, you have some physical limitations that have come up due to your um, epilepsy history, it's, it's a probably a really wise choice to work with a physical therapist to identify the areas that you need to be attending to and then transition over to an exercise protocol once you feel empowered to understand how to properly work with your body's needs. So definitely looking at um, hiring a professional or working with insurance to find a professional that can work with you first to identify and guide you into that practice. Now to talk about the exercise itself, um, if you are exercising alone, which many people do, um, taking those safety precautions, using head protection and having good environmental awareness um, I unfortunately witnessed uh, just at the gym myself, a person um, have a seizure while exercising and they fell forward and struck their head pretty hard on um, the weight bar, the bars of, or the stacks of hand weights, um, which was really, really scary. Um, they were fortunate and then they just kind of grazed their head and it didn't look like it was a massive head injury, but it was a, it was a pretty um, intimidating moment, even as a healthcare provider. Um, they were able to get treatment and, and were taken to the hospital, but it was a good moment for me to recognize that not only do you have to just be generally aware of safety, but that environment, you know, where if you were to fall, 
directionally what could happen um, is just something that as somebody who has epilepsy would need to be more aware of than, than the, the normal individual or the somebody without it. Um, so definitely have that awareness because that was, that was really shocking to witness. And I'm sure um, for many of us who were present there, it was kind of an awakening moment of, boy, that's, that could have been a lot worse. So the last one I want to talk about with gym and physical fitness is an area that I've spent a fair amount of time working with my rec therapists, and that is cycling. Um, cycling and the adaptations available for the cycling at cycling as an exercise is incredible. They have expanded so many of the options, um, and it is becoming rapidly becoming one of my favorite other than perhaps water-based um, areas for accessible and adaptive uh, physical activity. So trikes, recumbent bikes, electric support bikes, they have, you can adjust and modify a bicycle to fit just about any need. Um, and it's so incredible. You can even have for somebody who maybe doesn't have any ability to bike themselves, but wants to participate in cycling activities, they have the add-on features where you can be, you know, even up to an adult size, um, propelled via somebody else on a bike behind you in a, in a modified seat. It's really incredible. And so biking is an awesome way. And I, I highlighted a few different types here. I've got the trikes down below um, in the kind of blue teal color. Those are some trikes that have these incredible seat options that are, you can see are so supportive. And then the recumbent bike up top, which is the bikes that have the two wheels in front and one in the back, and you sit much lower, they're gonna give you different positioning options for what's comfortable for you. And it can be just a really fabulous way to get some physical activity in, in a way that is more, um, modifiable and safe. Now, again, all of the previous instruction would apply to these, but I do like to highlight cycling just because there has been such an incredible amount of growth in the technology that's available. And also something to be aware of with cycling is it's one of the areas where you can spend a lot of money, but you can also find it, um, find used bikes and have them modified to work for you. So our rec department at the local inpatient rehab hospital that I worked with did some incredible things with bikes that were identified at, for sale, um, picked up on marketplaces and Craigslist and things like that. And they were able to take those bikes and modify them in a way so that they would work for our clients. And it was immensely more affordable than buying them new. Um, and somebody got an amazing bike out of the deal. And I had, I had an individual who suffered seizures who had a brain injury. So she had an acquired seizure disorder who was an athletic phenom prior to her injury and was so devastated at that loss of physical um, um, activity and had a really hard time finding something she, she could do because she had continued issues with kind of dizziness and um, vision changes and things like that. And she thought she'd never ride a bike again because she just didn't think she'd have the balance for it. So we got her on a, a recumbent bike, like the red one here, and she was able to, even indoors, she would ride it on an indoor track that we have locally. And just watching her be able to re-engage in that physical activity was so awesome and um, really, really inspired me to make sure that I always evaluated and offered people the opportunity to find ways to be physically active um, at any stage in their life. So that's, that's a kind of a, a shout out to the cycling community for really being accessible. All right, I flew through that, guys. I was on a, I was on a roll. I would love to answer some questions, um, see what you guys have to, to say. And then obviously um, any of the product specifics that I talked about in this presentation, I have included on a links page as well as a key takeaway page so that you can kind of review the content. I'll also have access to the slides that will be emailed out. Um, and if you ever wanna engage with anything um, with me, I am available via um, email, but I'm also, I have an Instagram page called Equip Me OT. Um, and I love to chat with folks in the DMs there and I share lots of equipment ideas. So um, come follow me there or check out my website at equipmeot.com. I'm starting a newsletter um, that will be releasing June 1st. So there's a sign up for that on my about page on my website. So I'd absolutely love to engage and, and answer more questions. So what do we got? Yeah, there are a few questions, Lindsay. <laughs> So someone asked, which company was mentioned for the helmets that, that are incorporated into a normal hat? So those are, that's a company is called Rib Cap, R-I-B-C-A-P, Rib Cap. Um, they, I would recommend, they are available through Amazon, but I would recommend going through their website, ribcap.com 
to check out all of their options as they have a much more thorough instruction on measuring. It's super important you get the measurements right because um, I, I ordered one and I actually trialed one and I love it. It's an incredible product. I ordered a medium, just thought generally medium and I have a very small head and it was a little tight on me. So just be aware that you really wanna make sure you get the measurements right but they're wonderful to work with a great company, um, really kind of bucking the trend of the, the traditional um, protective helmet. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate for rib cap. Awesome, thank you. Another person asked um, if you can talk a little bit more about seizure bracelets or other identifiers. I know you meant you had the um, seatbelt identifier, but if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so if you are somebody with a chronic condition, this includes things like epilepsy, diabetes, or, um, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, certain heart conditions, you can get medical bracelets made for you that are actually considered a health product. So they would be covered under certain insurances or as a part of an, you could pay for it through an HSA. And actually the place where I got, so the one that was in the picture that was on the seatbelt, that was off of Etsy. So a lot of people are making these custom engraved whether it's a bracelet or a necklace, or I actually saw one that was even on the back of a phone case. So many of us carry our phones on us all the time. And so it was a phone case that was custom engraved that said the all the med pertinent medical information. So it had the name, the, I have epilepsy, you know, if found, da, 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 da. Um, so just having that on their personal, um, on their person at all times. And those were on Etsy but you can find them and have them custom engraved in a lot of different er a lot of different places. But definitely check with your um, healthcare providers because if you have a script, I do believe there are places that you can get those made that is covered by your um, medical benefits. And I, everybody's benefits are a little different, so I can't speak to the, um, the specifics of that, but I know that some of my clients have had them made and paid for by their insurance provider. Wonderful, thank you. Another question here. Um, what is a safe way to have my child out in the park, given that she tends to overheat and her temperature goes up? It's a really awesome question. And I'm so grateful that you asked that. So that's a common issue with a variety. That's obviously a common trigger, but that's a common issue for a variety of conditions. And some of the ways that I've helped manage that in the past um, was having um, built-in shades, you know, whether that's an umbrella or um, bringing a shade structure along if this, if the park itself does not have much shade option so that you're taking frequent breaks from the sun to help reduce the heat. I am a huge fan of the wearable cooling. Um, they're like a towel that, and I, I actually got my first exposure using it when I went to Disney world, um, because it was like a hundred degrees while we were there and people were passing out because it was so hot. Um, and somebody had introduced me to them. They're a product where you get them very, you get them wet, you put them in the refrigerator and then by putting them around the neck, um, it will help to quickly cool the body. And with children, I know that the areas that if you cool quick, so if they overheat quickly, one way to cool them down if they're showing severe signs of overheating is cooling the neck, the top of the head, the hands, and the bottoms of the feet. Um, I had a nurse <laughs> work with me on that one because I have a daughter who overheats very easily as well. Um, and so we strip off the, the shoes and socks and um, I will pour water on her feet. Um, we'll apply cold to the neck, the wrists and hands and the top of the head. And if you can start to cool those areas, the rest of the body will follow. I also have seen, obviously airflow can be really helpful. They have little portable battery powered um, fans that you can add to a stroller or to a, um, a wagon. Um, all of those things added and kind of combined can make it possible to, um, to stay cool when it gets particularly hot. Thank you. And Lindsay, someone mentioned that they've heard of wearable cooling vests with built-in ice packs. Have you? Um, yes, I have seen those. They, um, they are, that's a pretty extreme one for kids. I have a feeling kids might fight that a little bit, um, but maybe not. Maybe they, maybe your daughter would be one that would, would appreciate it as she does tend to overheat. I have seen those more in adults. Um, I know that they're something that um, like ultra runners and um, people who do kind of extreme fitness will do these wearable ice mat, uh, ice vests um, to keep their body core temperature down um, if they tend to overheat. They, I think they were actually, I don't quote me on this, but I, I remember reading about them in um, the ultra marathons that happen out, um, out west in like the desert runs and things like that. So 
that's where I've seen them used, but I, I would not be surprised in the least if they have them in the, in the pediatric world. I just have never um, had experience with those with kiddos. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Another question, um, what would be the recommendations to flight attendants if I'm having, if I'm on a long flight, maybe a 10 to 12 hour flight? That's a really good question too. Well, when I was, so I have to be honest, I have not traveled with somebody with epilepsy before. So I did research this before when I was creating this presentation and there was a lot of good resources for specifically geared for traveling um, via air travel with, um, with epilepsy. And um, one of the things they said was having a written out informative document about yourself and your um, seizure um, risks and things like that, that you can give to the height, the head flight attendant when you enter the airplane. So as you come on, as you take a seat, if you choose to do it then, or you can hit the button and have them come talk to you um, and just hand them the paper that gives them the information and just gives you a basic breakdown of like, here's where my medication is. If you have something that needs to be taken in an emergency, um, here are my triggers just in case, you know, if there's a lot of flash, you know, flashing light, or there's not a lot of air movement, it gets hot, or, you know, if you know of certain things, here's certain, you know, I have sensitivities to this or that, having them aware of that up front so that they can react appropriately ahead of time can make a big difference. Long flights are particularly difficult because, you know, 10 to 12 hours in the air, um, you know, a lot of times you're flying in situations where you cannot have an emergency landing quickly. So just kind of having an awareness of what your seizure management looks like before even venturing on such a long flight, certainly possible to do it. Um, but you would want to make sure you are really communicating well with, um, with those that you're going to be flying with. Great. Thank you. Okay. Another question. So what can we do if our community doesn't have a place for kids with special needs? Well, every community should have a place for kids with special needs. Um, one of the things that I have found in my own community, and I live in a relatively, I would say a medium size, but very, um, very family centered community where we're kind of a, there's a lot of families here, was rounding up a certain amount of support from the other families in our community and finding um, those within the system of government. So if you have a local government, finding the individuals in that government system that are particularly tied to either the schools, people who are advocating in the schools are often going to be willing to help advocate for community growth as well. Um, and finding those individuals and getting in their ear consistently with, um, with your specific interests in an in accessible park setup. It's really interesting because we actually saw this happen locally when somebody came to with a child with cerebral palsy and then another family who had a child with muscular dystrophy, both who re uh, relied on wheelchairs and walkers for all of their mobility. And we had no parks that were truly accessible. And so the two families got together with our newly elected parks and rec head and just started working with them on what it, what it looked like, gave them examples. And it took a couple of years for it to unfold and for the funding to happen. But once the millage was presented to our community, the support was overwhelming and it passed with like 95%. Um, uh, so the support was there, the awareness just wasn't. And so after building some awareness and building a partnership with that community leader, um, it did end up happening. And we have a very nice um, accessible park. It's, it, I, it's not perfect. Um, as an OT, I've still looked at it. I'm like, oh, I would have a few things I would have adjusted, but it's certainly a start. And it was an opening of a communication um, that started to build that partnership. And obviously the, the, you can, you cannot understate the value of having voices in the government being that are represented, uh, that are actually representing individuals in the community who live with chronic illnesses and disabilities, because oftentimes their voices are just not heard. And that's something that I am strongly advocating for um, as much as I can for anyone to, to be able to advocate in their communities. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, we have another question here. Are the, stro the strobe lights that are found in some traffic lights, red lights, strong enough to cause a seizure? I do not know. 
I mean, that would be, that would be, um, I, somebody else asked, um, somebody asked about ceiling fans and the ceiling fan and the way that it distorts light can cause seizure. And that was something I had never thought of. Um, so I would absolutely not say no to that because there's certainly going to be individuals who experience different sensory triggers than others. Um, but to be, I, I've never, I've never heard that specific, um, trigger. Others may have a different experience though. Thank you, Lindsay. And I think, I think it could happen depending on sensitivity and how long that they're looking at the lights. We have had constituents reach out to us that just being in the car with, you know, going by the trees and the sunlight coming in and out of the trees has triggered seizures. So I would definitely encourage that person to ask their neurologist that question. That's a great, that's a really good point. I don't see any other questions, but we do still have some time. So please put your questions in chat. Yeah, somebody just put that traffic lights are supposed to be non-triggering. And I do believe this is an area, again, that has been an advocacy point. Um, and again, where what we, th what we think of as triggers because we're aware of it, so many who do make the decisions are just not considering those things. So there's another opportunity for you know, if you're, if your community has one of those types of, of lights, um, you know, contacting those who are in charge of, and just making them aware that that's a problem because there's often an alternative and it just needs to be brought to somebody's attention. Looks like a lot of people with cooling vest experience, which is really interesting. And some considerations for being cautious with them. Please feel free to put them in chat. And discussing the, um, just thinking about the accessible parks. And one of the things that helped to promote um, was showing that, and this is something that I do a lot of, which is educating on universal design um, and the fact that accessible for one or accessible for all is the goal. <laughs> um, so when we create a community space, and this doesn't have to just be an outdoor space, I'm a big advocate for this includes um, any sort of community based um, museum, libraries, um, you know, school playgrounds obviously are considered the bare minimum is what you know, we create some of these bare minimum ADA requirements, but ADA does not always take into consideration things like seizures. Um, so often we have to bring attention to what it looks like to, um, to support an individual with a seizure disorder or, um, or similar to make sure that they're able to engage in those public spaces because it's not always something that has been considered when they created it because ADA, again, does not have a lot of seizure specific requirements. Well, I think that um, we will wrap up here. I don't see any other questions. Okay. So on behalf of the EFEPA, it's your epilepsy.com, the Brain Recovery Project, and Equip Me OT. We want to thank all of you out there for tuning in and all the wonderful speakers we've had during our webinar series, especially this afternoon speaker, Lindsay. Please keep an eye out for the post-session email with the recording, the presentation, key takeaways, and how to stay connected. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you.